How was the world created? Did a swirling mass of magma slowly cool into hard rock over billions of years? Or was it spoken into existence in seven days of creation? What if I told you a woman fell from the sky into an endless ocean, and that some friendly animals lifted clumps of earth up from the bottom of the sea to make land for her? Or what if I said that the world was dark because a greedy old man was keeping the sun in a box until Raven came into his house one day and stole that sun, placing it in the sky? These and many other Indigenous American creation stories are the subjects of today's video. Welcome to Indigenous History Now, the channel where we explore the histories, cultures, and languages of the indigenous peoples of the Western Hemisphere, primarily focusing on the lands that would become the United States. Now a couple points to kick off what may be the beginning of a series on native mythology. I'll be using the words myth or story, but in using these words I'm not making any commentary on the truth of these tales. Many myths and mythic traditions, especially when it comes to creation stories, can be heavily intertwined with religion, and far be it for me to be the arbiter of religious truth or validity. Instead, we'll be exploring these myths for their value as stories, significant pieces of literature that people pass on to one another, from which they draw meaning and into which they imbue meaning. A people's mythos, again especially when it comes to creation stories, is often used to communicate and transmit the important values and worldviews of that people. We can analyze these myths and get an insight into the way people think about themselves, their communities, the world, and their places within it. It's also worth pointing out that just because people carry a mythic tradition does not mean they don't think about or question it. People have been analyzing, conversing with, and commenting on their own mythic traditions for thousands of years. It doesn't take a modern Western academic to do that. So far as we know, no group north of Mexico had a written language prior to contact. Thus, they all developed rich traditions of oral storytelling where their histories and mythologies were passed verbally from generation to generation. Westerners who come from written traditions have often looked down on these oral traditions as imprecise, unsophisticated, unreliable, etc., often comparing oral storytelling to a game of telephone. Still, today, most historians do not regard oral history as real history. However, this complete disregard of oral tradition is not only unhelpful, it's also inaccurate, and says more about Western arrogance than really anything else. First off, for people who are passing on the entirety of their cultural history and knowledge orally, it isn't a game to them. Yeah, when you get a group of white second graders together in a circle, of course the story changes in a matter of five minutes from Johnny kicking a ball to Johnny robbing a bank, because we know it's a game, so we treat it like a game. No practitioner of an oral tradition treats their tradition like a game, so let's stop making that comparison because it's just stupid. Yes, oral accounts can change over time, but so can written ones. Pretty much every written account of a given Greek myth is different from the last. In Egyptian monumental inscription, not only was it extremely common for rulers to greatly exaggerate their deeds, it was also not uncommon for subsequent rulers to rewrite previous inscriptions, intentionally changing or even erasing the narratives of their predecessors. Just writing something down is no guarantee against the story shifting. Furthermore, oral traditions have highly sophisticated methods of passing on their knowledge. It isn't uncommon for a traditional storyteller to have memorized hundreds of thousands, even millions of lines of text. The Manash, the orally transmitted origin story of the Central Asian Kyrgyz nation, is over half a million lines long. <laughs> To teach someone that much material is not a simplistic or rudimentary process, and it can often be done with high degrees of accuracy. Western scholars have frequently been surprised by the extent to which oral traditions can remain consistent and unchanged over time. Take for example one of the oldest surviving oral traditions, that of the Rig Veda. The Rig Veda is the oldest extant Hindu text, written around 1500 to 1000 BCE in a language called Vedic Sanskrit. This language has descendants spoken today, but it itself is not. Now, why am I talking about a written text to illustrate the accuracy of oral tradition? because the Rig Veda is not primarily passed down via reading the text. For thousands of years, and still today, oral transmission is the primary means of preservation, and it has even preserved the old pronunciation. Like I said, Vedic Sanskrit is no longer spoken, but instead of applying pronunciation from modern Indian languages like Hindi to the 3500-year-old text, 
Brahmins have orally preserved the old Vedic pronunciation. What's more, Vedic Sanskrit is what's called a pitch accent language. These are languages where the pitch of a word can impact its meaning, similar to tonal languages but not the same. Again, the proper pitch for each word has been preserved orally through a pretty creative technique. Brahmins raise and lower their hands while they're speaking to indicate the correct pitch of a given word. This is also used to preserve the cadence of the chant. Historical linguists have reconstructed the pronunciation of Vedic Sanskrit, and compared to modern Brahmins who learned through oral tradition, it's a near-perfect match. Yes, they can refer to the text if they forget some of the words, but textual transmission does not explain the perfect 3,500-year-old pronunciation. That is entirely the result of faithful and accurate oral transmission. Mnemonic devices to aid in memory for oral transmission, such as these hand motions for the Rig Veda, are not uncommon and are indicative of the inherent complexity involved in preserving an oral tradition. Famously, many tribes of the Great Plains used what's called a winter count. They would have a tanned animal hide on which they would paint every year a single image representing the significant events of that year, thereby helping their oral historians remember and pass on their national histories. So we've established that oral traditions can accurately convey information over generations, but it's also true that we do see variation in oral storytelling. It's well documented that stories which cross cultural and ethnic boundaries often show up with different details in different places. The story I mentioned earlier of the woman falling from the sky is very common throughout the eastern U.S. She falls into a world covered in water and animals swim down and lift up the bottom of the sea, thus creating land. This story falls into a category known as the primordial waters archetype because the world begins as an empty expanse of water. In the Pacific Northwest, there's a very similar story of animals diving for Earth. However, this version begins with Raven who doesn't want to wash his face. When his father-in-law threatens to take Raven's wife away because of his poor hygiene, Raven relents and washes his face, causing a flood that covers all the land. It's from this point that animals on a raft begin diving to retrieve Earth from the seafloor. Thus, the PNW version is not a primordial water story, but a flood myth, a different archetype. Even within the same culture, however, it's not uncommon for storytellers to change details from one rendition to the next, adding here, leaving out there, etc. So if oral transmissions are capable of precision and accuracy, why do they tolerate variation and embellishment? Doesn't this make them untrustworthy? Well, that question itself reveals the answer. You see, Western culture, especially among academics, is obsessed with precision and exactness, a pension that makes the perceived inaccuracy of oral traditions very discomforting. But not every culture shares this obsession. Oral traditions are capable of high degrees of accuracy, and in instances such as the Rig Veda or the Manush, they can be real sticklers for that accuracy, but exactness in transmission doesn't always have to be a high priority for storytellers. Rather than seeing this variability in oral transmission as a flaw or liability, we should see it as another data point of what myth reveals to us about people. It shows us the ways that people engage with their histories and mythologies, the ways that their perceptions of their past and maybe the values they currently hold can change through time. Variability does not undermine the trustworthiness of the entire oral tradition. Instead, it itself forms a record of the people's history, and for that, should be valued just as much as precision. Okay, let's get into some creation stories. We'll focus on creation stories north of Mexico, though some of the patterns we discuss may well be used by peoples in Latin America as well. As with all things in North America, there is an obscene amount of diversity, so think of this video as a rough overview more than any definitive guide. In the 50s, anthropologist Anna Ruth surveyed over 300 indigenous creation stories and concluded that most can be divided into eight archetypes. There are stories that didn't fit into any of the eight, but these eight are the most common. Likewise, details from one archetype frequently get borrowed by another, so any given nation's creation story could be drawing from multiple archetypes. The eight archetypes are Earth Diver, Two Creators, Blind Brother, World Parents, Emergence, The Spider as Creator or First Being, Creation Through Struggle or Robbery, and what she dubbed the Emir Type. The first two, Earth Diver and Two Creators, are by far the most common. 
Earth Diver being found everywhere except Alaska and the Southwest, and the two creators largely covering the same distribution. In this Haudenosaunee creation story, we see elements of both Earth Diver and two creators' plot lines. In the Sky World, there are Sky Beings, who live largely the same as the Haudenosaunee on Earth. They eat fruit from a tree that provides light and sustenance for their world. One day, a woman and a chief get married. When the woman becomes pregnant, the chief thinks the child isn't his. He has a dream where the tree is uprooted, and he convinces the community to help him do this task, scattering fruit everywhere in the process. He and his wife look into the hole, whereupon he pushes her into it. She falls from the sky world, catching roots and seeds from the hole as she falls. All the world below her is an expanse of water, and the animals, seeing her falling and knowing she'll drown, send birds to fly up and catch her. They lower her onto the back of a turtle, and other animals decide to build a home for her by diving into the water and retrieving the earth from the bottom of the sea. Many different animals attempt the long, harrowing dive, and some die in the process. Muskrat manages to grab a handful of dirt and just barely makes it back to the surface alive. Turtle accepts the dirt on his shell, and Muskrat makes the dive over and over again, slowly but surely building all the land atop Turtle's shell, which grows in the process one handful at a time. The young woman begins walking around this new land, dropping the seeds from her dress, which then take root and grow. One seed grows into a huge tree topped with a glowing orb that provides light. In time, the woman gives birth to a daughter who grows very quickly. The woman tells her daughter to walk around the earth, and as she does, it grows even larger. The daughter becomes pregnant with twin boys, by the wind in some versions, by a suitor in others. The twins talk to each other in the womb, and it's clear that one is kind and the other evil. Upon birth, the good twin comes out normally, but the evil twin deliberately kills his mother by coming out through her armpit. They are named, respectively, Good Mind and Evil Mind. The two mature quickly, and begin a process of crafting the world as we know it today. Good Mind buries his mother, and from her grave springs maize, squash, beans, and sweet potato, all main food staples of Haudenosaunee society. The grandmother teaches him how to make use of these foods, as well as teaching him how to craft plants and trees, and he creates many plants and trees useful for people. Evil Mind follows behind, creating harmful plants like weeds and attempting to destroy the useful ones. Good Mind searches for his father, and after passing several tests, meets him on a mountaintop. He asks for power, and his father gives him four bags of life containing creatures that are good and useful for people. While returning home, Good Mind opens the bags, thus releasing water animals, birds, insects, and fish and land animals. He tells his grandmother, and she begins discovering the names of the animals and putting fat in their bodies. She creates a pool of fat and allows the useful animals like elk, beaver, or moose to swim in it, thus giving them a permanent supply of good-tasting fat. Deer had been injured and is healed with the fat, thus becoming a healing medicine for later people. Some animals that are not desired, like mink and otter, jump into the pool, but Goodmind catches them as they try to sneak out and wrings the fat out of their body. To this day, their fat does not taste good. Evil Mind grabs a bag of unwanted creatures and puts them in the pool, creating the likes of bugs, worms, and rattlesnakes. He deliberately pollutes rivers and streams with mud and kicks rocks in them to hinder passage. He fills pathways with nettles and thorns to make travel difficult. Grandmother creates stars in the heavens, and Goodmind creates the sun out of his mother's face and the moon out of her breasts. The grandmother sings a song to help her return to the sky world, but not before warning Goodmind that his brother will try to kill him. She advises Goodmind to lock his brother up in a cave with other bad creatures and evil spirits, which he does. To this day, they can still be heard trying to escape. Goodmind defeats Defender, leader of the False Faces, a Haudenosaunee secret society, and orders him to be useful to the humans about to be created. He agrees to help humans when they offer tobacco to him, create masks from trees, and use them as he stipulates. Goodmind defeats Thunder, who agrees to provide rain for the earth and to slay evil monsters when they escape from the underworld. Goodmind then creates male and female humans out of clay in a pool of water. After they dry, he speaks to them and they come alive. He teaches them how to hunt, fish, live as relations with one another, how to pray with tobacco, about their ancestry, and many other things. He then leaves for the sky world with all other first beings, leaving humans to provide for themselves and live as he taught them. In this story, we can see many aspects of Haudenosaunee life and culture. The importance of women and their matrilineal system. The use of wild and cultivated plants. Respect for elders and the care of children by elders. The reciprocal relationship of mutual benefit between humanity and the natural world. The place of tobacco in prayer and ceremony. Aspects of cosmology, like the division between an upper and lower world, etc. 
We can also see typical aspects of the Earth Diver archetype up to the point where the twins are born. A woman falls from the sky, is saved and assisted by animals, a contest is held to bring up the Earth, a contest in which many fail and one succeeds only with great effort, the turtle serves as the foundation of the Earth, this is why many indigenous people refer to North America as Turtle Island, someone wanders around the Earth's perimeter and makes it larger, etc. After the twins' birth, elements of the two creators archetype take over. The two creators serve as both transformer figures, making the world ready for humanity, and culture heroes, modeling proper human behavior. It is very common, though not universal, for the two creators to be a pairing of good and evil, order and chaos, where one tries to make a pristine, idyllic, very hospitable world, and the other foils that by introducing elements of hardship to humanity, ranging from mild inconveniences to severe dangers. Now here is a good point to sidetrack for a second. When studying indigenous mythologies, you can't get very far before you need to discuss Christian revisionism. Christian missionaries had a tendency to rewrite the mythologies of non-Christian people, inserting Christian worldviews and motifs into them that are absent from original source material in an effort at conversion. This is a phenomenon we see all around the world over several centuries, and it is the bane of every student of comparative mythology. Just do me a favor, uh, go ask a Celtic studies professor about this. Just do it. Just, just do it. This is a topic that deserves much more discussion than we'll get into here, but suffice it to say, if we are going to understand a people's worldview as they saw things, not as how some other people wanted them to see things, it's important to piece apart what in a mythos are genuine components or views from that source culture, and what are Christian rewritings. The good-evil dichotomy of the two creators archetype is a perfect example to see this in play. A dichotomy between good and evil is a very strong theme in Christian worldview, thus missionaries tended to insert this theme into stories that didn't already have it, or at least play it up to a greater extent than is authentic in stories that did. Now, we may be tempted to make things easy for ourselves and declare that any time the good and evil trope is present is a telltale sign of Christian shenanigans, but as you probably guessed, it's not that easy. Christians do not have a monopoly on a good and evil worldview, so just because it's there does not inherently mean the story has been revised. So how can we tell whether its presence is original to the story or a later Christian insertion? Well, the good and evil dichotomy does not work the same way in every culture, and if it's not acting like a typical Christian good and evil trope, then it probably isn't, and it's probably original. Fortunately for us, the two creators archetype does provide a good example of how this relationship behaves in a non-Christian culture. In the Haudenosaunee story, both the good force and the evil force are creators. They are two brothers, and there seems to be a pretty equal power relation between them. Good mind never undoes any of the changes that evil mind introduces, nor does he seem capable of stopping evil minds meddling in the first place. This is very different from the Christian perspective, where the good force is all-powerful and the evil force is clearly subordinate. They are not equals. What's more, only one of them is a creator, the good force. The evil force never actually creates anything. The presence of struggle and hardship in the world is something introduced by the benevolent creator as a punishment on mankind for bad behavior, whereas in the Haudenosaunee story, hardship was created by the evil creator. Other iterations of the two creators archetype appear on the surface to have an unequal power balance like in the Christian tradition, but in reality, again, good and evil are more balanced. Take the Maidu creation myth, which features Earthmaker and the trickster Coyote. Just by their names, a missionary might conclude that Earthmaker is an all-powerful soul creator. However, when we dig deeper, Earthmaker and Coyote's power relation is not at all one-sided. Earthmaker constantly creates, and Coyote constantly corrupts those creations. Again, Earthmaker never undoes any of the corruption Coyote introduces, and his designs both for the world and for Coyote are constantly being frustrated by Coyote. Earthmaker eventually begins to tire of Coyote's antics and tries repeatedly to kill him, but every time, Coyote outsmarts Earthmaker and gets away unharmed. Rather than an all-powerful good and a subordinate evil like in the Christian perspective, the two forces in this Maidu myth are rather equally matched, more like the sibling relationship of the Haudenosaunee story. And what's more, the evil analog trickster character also has creative abilities, and his actions don't always seem that evil or harmful. 
And I don't say this just by modern standards, but also by the standards of traditional Maidu culture. For example, Earthmaker had decreed that when people died, they were to be laid in the river and come alive again. Coyote decreed that once someone died, they would stay dead. Clearly a worse alternative than Earthmaker's intention. However, Earthmaker had declared that men will have wives, but won't sleep with them. And Coyote retorts, Why will we not make it so that men and women hug and kiss and tickle one another and laugh and feel good? So you can thank Coyote both for death and your sex life. And just to be clear, Maidu culture was not puritanical like Christian culture, so this isn't some underhanded equating of sex with death. From these two examples, the Haudenosaunee myth and the Maidu myth, we can see that the good-evil pairing of the two creators' archetype isn't always a contrasting black-and-white dichotomy between good and evil. It's much more gray. It's more of a harmonized balance between order and chaos. This value for balance is something we see cross-culturally throughout North America. Alright, on to other myths. A very similar archetype to two creators is Blind Brother, found only in Southern California and Arizona, though the motif of a blind underwater ruler is also present in the Meskwak recreation story from the Great Lakes. In Blind Brother, two brothers live in the depths of the ocean from which they rule over the seas. One day they swim near the surface, and the older brother tricks the younger brother into opening his eyes underwater, whereupon they are destroyed by the salt water. The older, seeing brother then engages in acts of creation similar to the good twin of the two creators archetype. Resembling the evil twin, the blind brother is not as capable as his sighted elder, and thus takes to destroying or corrupting the sighted brother's handiwork before retreating once again to the depths. The order-chaos dichotomy carries many of the same themes as seen in the two creators archetype. Likewise, the conflict between siblings present here and often in the two creators type as well may be emblematic of the lived realities of family conflict. Our next archetype is the World Parents, better known as Sky Father and Earth Mother. This is an archetype very common in Indo-European cultures, but it's also widely present in East Asian and Polynesian cultures. In North America, it's mostly represented in the Southwest and Southern California. A good example is the Hawaiian creation myth where Vakea, the father of heaven, and Papahano Moku, the mother of earth, got married, and out of their union are born the Hawaiian Islands. Well, in truth, only five of them. Hawaii, Maui, Kaho'olavi, Kauai, and Ni'iho. Vakea cheated on Papa and conceived Moloka'i and Lana'i with another goddess, and Papa got jealous and conceived O'ahu with another god. Vakea and Papa also gave birth to the first humans. Their firstborn was Haloa. He was a sickly child and died young, but his parents tended and watered his grave every day, and out of it sprouted the taro plant, the staple crop of Hawaiian society. They then had another son, also named Haloa, who became the progenitor of all Hawaiian people. They taught him to respect and revere his older brother, and in return, the elder Haloa would always care for the younger Haloa. In this archetype, the origins of the world, humanity, and certain cultural customs and behaviors are the results of a relationship between a father in the sky and a mother in the earth parents which continued to care for their children throughout time. Then we have the emergence archetype, common in the Southwest and the Great Plains. In this archetype, humanity begins its existence deep within the Earth. They're typically hideous and physically deformed, often with horns and tails. They live in a state of literal and metaphorical darkness, wallowing in squalor, until some guide descends into this nether realm and leads the people upwards. This guide could be the Corn Mother, Creator Twins, or some other culture hero, and animals like moles typically help the humans and their guide along the way. There are typically many layers of new worlds that humans pass through in their emergence out of the Earth until they finally break the surface into the modern world. In this journey, the humans are gradually transformed into their modern figures. They lose their horns and tails, gain mouths and eyes, etc. In some recountings, these transformations happen within the Earth, and in others, they happen after humans emerge on the surface. The humans are also given by their guide all the trappings of society, taught how to farm and hunt, instructed in ceremony, etc. In this emergence cosmology, the form of humanity and the world as it is today is not a fallen corruption of prior perfection. Rather, it is perfection. The culmination of a journey that saw humanity's rise out from a state of corruption and squalor. One has to wonder how this difference in perspective impacts the way emergence myth cultures view and interact with their world. Then there's the creation as struggle or robbery archetype, appearing along the Pacific coast down to California, in the plateau region, and scattered among the southwest, southeast, and Great Lakes. 
The Raven example from the Pacific Northwest I mentioned at the beginning of this video is of this type. In this story, the world and humanity already exist in much their current form, except that there is no light. Everything is dark, cold, and colorless. Raven finds his way into a house of an old man, inside which there is light and heat and color. Raven notices that there is a special box the old man has a particular penchant for and resolves to steal whatever's inside, usually without even knowing what it is. After a while of visiting and bantering and playing mind games, Raven eventually tricks the old man into opening the box, whereupon he swoops in, grabs the contents, and flies away. Lo and behold, the box contained the sun, which Raven now carries in his beak. As he flies, little chunks fall away, some landing in the sky to become the stars and moon, and some falling to the earth to become volcanoes. At the time, Raven was white, but due to the smoke and heat from the sun in his mouth, his feathers get stained black. Raven eventually can no longer hold the burning sun and has to release it, whereupon it assumes its place in the sky, providing light, warmth, and color to all the world. Many things get stolen other than light, such as fire or water, but they're generally of central importance to human existence. Rather than beginning the world in a state of primordial nothingness, these stories aren't concerned with how the world came to be prior to the theft, just with how the theft transformed things into what they are today. Furthermore, we're seeing again the creative influence of trickster characters. Almost invariably, it's a trickster performing the theft, usually involving some sort of trickery upon the hoarder to enable the theft, and importantly, the trickster does not intend to bring a gift to humanity or the world. Raven steals the sun simply because he wants to steal the sun, not because he's feeling particularly altruistic. It's only a happy accident that this act of selfishness benefits the whole world. Cross-culturally, tricksters are generally regarded as allegories for chaos, hence why their actions and intentions are typically rather morally ambiguous. So this theft archetype places the influence of chaos and unpredictability in a central role in the function of the world, but not in a negative way. The theft archetype highlights how blessings in life can come as the result of pure chance. Our next archetype is the spider creator archetype, again found mainly in the southwest and southern California. Man, the Southwest really seems to be a hotbed for mythological diversity. Essentially, the world is spun into being from the web of Spider-Woman, very commonly a female figure of great power and wisdom paralleling the respect and high regard for women in these societies. In some versions, the ground is spun from Spider-Woman's web. In others, the four corners of the Earth are held down by webs from Spider-Woman, yet in others, humans are saved from a great flood by rafts or nets woven by Spider-Woman. Commonly, she also teaches basket weaving, rug weaving, cloth making, and any other weaving related activities. Our final archetype is the Emir type, which Ruth named after the Norse variation of this myth. In North America, this type appears in the Eastern Great Lakes and Pacific Northwest. In this myth, the world is created from the corpse of a dead man, woman, or giant. The skull is made into the sky, bones become stones, hair becomes vegetation, breasts become mountains, blood becomes water, etc. We've already analyzed some of these archetypes, but I hope you can also see parallel themes that cross archetypal boundaries. Many of these creation stories have a very intimate and symbiotic relationship between humanity and the natural world, not at all an adversarial one or one where humans dominate nature. Animals catch Sky Woman's fall and they create the entire Earth for her. Animals help dig humanity to the Earth's surface in the Emergence Tale, and Mole becomes blind in the process. However, neither is this a relationship where humans leave nature entirely alone in pristine wilderness. Indigenous American societies did not have a concept of untouched wilderness. That is an idea created by the Western conservation movement. That's a fun little grenade that I'm just going to leave here for now and come back to in a later video. In the myths, creator beings often fashion animals and plants into forms suitable for human consumption and harness natural forces to work for humanity's benefit. In return, they teach humanity ceremonies to honor their relationship with the natural world. In World Parents, humanity is born the child of Mother Earth, and in Emir, the Earth is the body of a human. In the Hawaiian creation myth, children are the younger siblings of the taro plant, embodying the Hawaiian proverb, he li'ika aina, he kawa ke kanaka. The land is ruler, humanity is servant. We see a prominent and powerful role of both men and women in creation. We see a prominent role of tricksters and chaos in creation. Also, many of the archetypes are not ex nihilo creation, from nothing creation. A world already exists, and the story isn't at all concerned with explaining how that world came to be. 
This is especially prominent in the theft narrative. The tradition doesn't care about how the old man came to acquire the sun in a box. In the context of the Earth Diver Sky Woman stories, in response to a question along the lines of, if Turtle is holding up the Earth, what's holding up Turtle? A rather famous phrase is, it's Turtles all the way down. Meaning essentially, we're not concerned with that. This penchant for beginning a creation story in a world that already exists rather than needing to explain the exact origins of the entire universe may be a recognition of the cyclical nature of human existence. We're born, we live, we give birth, we die in an endless cycle. The earth spins from day to day, season to season, year to year in a cycle older than any of us can even comprehend. We're born into pre-existing societies with long-established social, religious, maybe even political structures, and for most of us, those societies are going to be the same when we die. From the perspective of most people throughout history, they don't enter into the beginning of a new world, but smack in the middle of an already established order. Thus, starting a creation story with an already extant world may be a reflection of that cyclical nature. It brings a sort of comfort knowing the world has always been here and that it always will be. Further south in Mesoamerican cosmology, this cyclical nature is a core and foundational tenet. Another thing that needs to be mentioned is the incredible degree to which indigenous creation stories are place-based. Most of these stories don't explain the creation of the world as a whole, as a theoretical globe. Rather, they're deeply intertwined with their specific locations on the Earth. In my Native History of Seattle video, I visited the site where, in Duwamish legend, North Wind and Storm Wind battled it out and the world was freed from glacial cold. There are large stones visible in the Duwamish River to this day that are remnants of the battle. The Lakota have an emergence tradition, and Wind Cave in South Dakota, today protected as a national park, is the very cave out of which humanity first emerged. People didn't emerge from some nameless random concept of a cave, but from a specific place that Lakota can visit and see. Many eastern tribes with variations of the Earth Diver 2 Creator's Tale that I related earlier can take you to the specific caves where their traditions relate evil mind is still imprisoned in the earth. These mythologies aren't abstract and theoretical. They can't be transplanted to another location. They're physical. They are written onto a landscape, and to remove them from that place would be to sever a real, tangible connection. These stories are both reflections of and reinforcers of indigenous people's connections to their ancestral lands. So much more could be said about indigenous mythology and creation traditions that we've merely scratched the surface today. I'd love to see other creation stories that I didn't mention in the comments, and for any indigenous folk watching, any commentary on what these creation stories mean to you. With that, thank you all very much for watching. If you like my content and want to help me grow and invest more in this work, please do head on over and support me on Patreon, link on screen in the description. Don't forget to like, subscribe, leave a comment, and ring the bell to never miss out on a video. Thank you all again. I will see you next time.